Hi, I'm so glad you're here. The Covenant of Water is truly one of the most gripping, exquisite novels I have ever read. And I've been reading since I was three. It's my 101st book club pick. I'm so enthralled with this epic story. I think of it as a modern masterpiece. And now I'm excited for you to hear our captivating conversation with the brilliantly talented author, Dr. Abraham Verghese. What an honor to be with you. On this six-part podcast, we're diving into all 10 parts of The Covenant of Water. That is the best Bye Felicia <laughs> moment I ever read. <laughs> we'll also hear from readers like you. What was the hard truth that you hope to convey in writing this book? Hmm. Oh, thank you for that very thoughtful question. Come along with me on a soulful, extraordinary journey through adventure, family secrets, medical mysteries, romance, and finally, the shimmering resilience of the human spirit. This is The Covenant of Water, the podcast. Hello, everybody. Okay, we're back and in episode five in our series on my latest book club pick. Do I need to even tell you that it's The Covenant of Water? Things are really starting to heat up uh, in podcast land here. We're talking about parts seven and eight in this episode. And as always, I'm with Dr. Abraham Verghese, the best-selling author of this exquisite book. I love the word exquisite, and I think that is so fully represented, that word, uh, describing this book. So let's dig in. Time to get started with part seven. So Invictus, part seven. At the beginning of part seven, Lennon Evermore. Lennon Evermore, that's that little baby with the fist, right? Uh, who once stuck his fist outside his mother's womb, is now almost nine years old, and he awakens one morning and to find his parents and baby sister are dying of smallpox. His father's last words to him are on page 469. Follow the straight path. Lennon really takes this to heart. And at first I was like, God, he thinks it means a straight path. But if you're nine years old and you don't know that it was a metaphor, tell us. Well, I think it becomes his ritual for safety. You know, he's watched his whole world fall apart. Mm -hmm. And a part of him believes that his father's crookedness and shady dealings led to this consequence. So he is going to take it literally. He's going to follow the straight path. Mm. Was that... Um challenging scene to write with him in with his his parents his sister dying his father dying yes it was challenging i think i i i wrote long too long mm -hmm. i got very wrapped up in the details of smallpox which is a disease that has disappeared you know when i was a child growing up it was common to see people with smallpox scars even if the disease was no longer as common and ethiopia the same thing so I got into lots of descriptions about the pustules and the phases, and, but it was altogether too long, and my editor... Thank God, Peter. Thank God for the editor, Peter. He stepped in and said, you know, this, this, this can be compressed. Yes. You know, and it was difficult in that sense. I, I, I felt it was poignant, rich, and the details were important, but I think the biggest detail is that he becomes an orphan. Speaking of that, I never ask you this question. It just occurred to me you were working during COVID the whole time. Was it reminiscent to you of the AIDS crisis when you were in East Tennessee, when in the beginning nobody really knew what was going on? Yeah, it was very reminiscent of the HIV uh, epidemic in the sense that I could see a generation of young physicians because those were the people on the front line mm -hmm. in the emergency room, critical care. I mean, I did my share, but comparatively little compared to all my junior peers. I could see how this would be the defining illness in their careers, the way HIV had been in mine. Mm -hmm. But the other thing was, you know, here I was writing about leprosy, about tragic deaths, and I was writing about smallpox. and. All around me, people were dealing with the poignancy of COVID-related deaths and, you know, 
Uh, and it was interesting to me to, know, to, to affirm again that when you reach that stage of your, you know, you're dying or you're on death's door, beyond the medical, it's always the same things you come back to. It's um, family, it's faith, it's um, the rituals of, you know, of comfort brought to you by a priest or a physician. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of very affirming, sadly, that 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 has not changed that you know 1900 or 2021 it's the same mm -hmm. we are essentially humans and our our needs at those times of distress have been unchanged since antiquity and they'll never be provided by a chatbot or a robot or it'll be another human being and i think the most distressing part of covid both for patients and families and providers was that the patient was often alone and the provider or nurse was gowned and scrubbed right. and it was just and gowned and masked and, you know, to die in that anonymity, you know, it had echoes of the it, lepers yeah, who it, die, it, you know, on the side of the road and no one there to attend them, no one to worry about them. I mean, it had echoes of that. Mm. So it was a very, very poignant time. So back at Parambil, Mariama is now eight years old, and Amachi tells her the story of lighting the vilaku lamp the night she was born. She says, in chapter 58, light the lamp, on page 474, Big Amachi has this to say. Who says we only light this lamp for a firstborn son? How about for the first Mariama? See, I knew you were special. So is lighting the lamp for Miriama a sign of, or a symbol that, that times are changing? I think it's also a symbol that her grandmother is empowering her, mm. telling her that there's nothing you can't do and you can do everything a male child could have done. Mm. Uh, my mother was one of two sisters and uh, their younger brother died very young. And she tells me that her great grandmother lit the lamp for, for them hmm. in a breaking convention, but, or at least told her the story that she had lit the lamp for them. And it made my mother feel special, feel like she could accomplish many things. And her father, my namesake, his name mm -hmm. was Abraham, uh, he also empowered his daughters. He, he sort of didn't push them to marry very young or anything like that. He encouraged them to educate themselves. He himself was an intelligent, well-read man, but he never finished his schooling and he envied people with education because he equated education with power. Mm -hmm. So his three daughters all, you know, got college degrees and were very, you know, in their own ways, pretty accomplished and confident. And to me that lighting the lamp is the metaphor for that, you know? Mm. Okay, so Philippos recovers from his opium addiction and begins to live a sober life, but Amachi, suspects or certainly doesn't know for sure that he's going to remain sober. And, and uh, in chapter 58 of Light the Lamp, this is on page 475, and you write, She isn't entirely free of the worry that one day his routines will collapse like a hut in torrential rain, and he'll go back to the wretched wooden box and his black pearls. It isn't faith alone that brings him to evening prayers or to church. He needed such rituals to rebuild his faith in himself. If there were not a God, her son would have to invent one. One of the things I think, Abraham, is that anybody who's uh, ever loved someone suffering from addiction, that they can relate to this, this kind of fear and anxiety that Amachi feels. It's interesting because you've been in these addiction spaces. You talk about it um, in The Tennis Partner a lot. Uh, why can't uh, faith alone heal addiction? Actually, what else needs to happen? Faith alone often does heal, heal addiction. I've seen faith-based recovery programs mm -hmm. in San Antonio that are remarkably effective. But I think what they have in common with AA, for example, is they're giving you a community a place to give up your loneliness and they, they populate your world and to give up your secrecy, whether it's in the form of 
confessing sins or standing up and saying, hi, I'm John, I'm an alcoholic, or, you know. Yeah, because secrecy is in the same room with loneliness. Secrecy is in the same room as loneliness, yes. I love that line. So after Samuel dies, um, Philippos um, offers his son, Jopin, the job of manager at Parambil. I thought that was such a powerful scene. And um, when... Japan explains to him, Japan dis- explains to him that you think that you are one thing, but you really are another, that you are a part of this whole caste system. Uh, Lillian, I heard you had a question. Hi, this is Lillian, and I could not put this book down. One of the most fascinating conversations in the book was the one between Philippos and Jopan when Philippos first asked Jopan to tend to the land in Parambrel. And I want to read it so I make sure that I capture it correctly. He said, the kind, he being Jopan said, the kind slave owners in India or anywhere were always the ones who had the greatest difficulty seeing the injustice of slavery. Their kindness, their generosity compared to cruel slave owners made them blind to the unfairness of a system of slavery that they created, they maintained, and that favored them. This was clearly eye-opening to Philippos. Who do you think most needs to hear this message today? Wow, thank you so much for that inspired reading, first yeah, of all. Lillian, <laughs> Lillian sat down and said, I'm yeah. going to do a reading for you all. Thank you, Lillian. You know, I, I labored over that passage a long time because I didn't want it to sound like exposition. I really wanted mm. it to be organic to the two characters. And, um, you know, Philippos thinks he's broad-minded, thinks he's, you know, uh, empathetic with Joppa and his childhood friend. But there is a kind of blindness that, that one can be guilty of uh, by taking for granted... Yes. The, the, I mean, we see this when we talk about, you know, um, health inequity. It's sometimes difficult for people who don't experience health inequity, who have the agency to challenge their doctors, who have the means to go get a sec- second opinion to understand why there should be health inequity. And so I really wanted to write something that um, would startle the listener, who might discover, as we've all discovered, that we ourselves are, are guilty of a kind of blindness when it comes to disparities of all kind, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, in a way, this also echoes what it must have been like for my grandparents, less so for my parents, where at some level they didn't see the injustice. They, this was the way it they, was. They, they, it was a, they were just, yeah, contributing to the system. As and and they were benevolent yes. compared to us. We're not talking about slavery. We're just talking about relationships between, you know, people who've worked for one family for Servants a long time. in the house, yes. Technically, they could leave and be anywhere, but in the reality, they were, there was a dependence that had gone on for so long that they would be a little lost, at least mm-hmm. one generation would. So that was a critical scene for me. I worked on that a lot. I mean, that's one scene I can talk about because I was reading up about, you know, communism in Kerala, reading ab- about the class struggle, borrowing some of the language of that struggle, um, and, and there is a reason that the communists held sway from time to time. To, even today in Kerala, they win the state election, they lose it, they win. It's because for the poor, there was a strong sense that, you know, benevolence is not enough. We need equity that's measurable, that's palpable. And that was a long time coming. Turn to page 487, because this was a great truth and reconciliation moment for me, I thought. Oh, that's a nice way of putting it. Thank you. Yes. And I thought he was el- educating Philippos in the kindest manner, but also being very succinct and direct about it. Right. I thought it was so well done. He was pointing out to him that what would be unfair if Philippos offered that to one of his cousins would be, un- you know, would be. But if it's for Samuel Pullian, then it's generous. What you see as being generous or as being exploitation, has everything to do with who you're giving it to. It helped that my father believed it was his fate to be a Pulean. He felt he was lucky to be working for Parambal. He felt rich at the end of his life, his wages adding up, and a plot for his hut, and one for his son, and now one more. 
Mm. I love it when he says, my father was no slave. He was beloved here, but he was never your equal. So he wasn't rewarded as one. Ah, ah, ah. Write some words, Abraham. <laughs> Come on. That's amazing. That scene reminds me, actually, of when I was building my school in South Africa in 2007. And I first went to sit down with the architects. I'd had a conversation about the kind of school I wanted and what I wanted the girls to have, because my school serves underserved girls from you know challenged communities. And I sat down with the architects, and I was saying, well, where are the closets? And where's there room for a dresser? And there's no place to hang their clothes, and all of that. And I remember one who told me that this is good enough. This is good enough. These are good. These are poor black girls. Do you realize what you're doing? These are poor black girls. So it's that assumption that whatever you're, it's, it's exactly what you just said. It's about who you're giving it to. It's yeah. about who you're giving it to. And I must say, I'm really encouraged that the reader identified with mm -hmm. that section because it's universal. I didn't want that to be just true for this story. I mm -hmm. thought it's important. It happens all the time. We're still living in that world at, yeah. at many different levels. One of our readers, Dennis, also wanted to comment on the caste system. Dennis? Hi, I'm Dennis Tyler. I'm a professor at Fordham University, and I teach a class on Opus Book Club titled The Phenomenon of Opus Book Club. I really enjoyed your novel, especially your depiction of India's caste system. Your depiction actually reminds me of a line in Isabel Wilkerson's cast, a different selection in Opus Book Club. One of the things that Wilkerson writes is that caste is a disease and none of us is immune. How does the covenant of water depict caste as a disease that stigmatizes groups of individuals? To what extent do the main characters attempt to resist the caste system throughout the book? Thank you for that, you know, erudite question and for quoting the book Cast, which is a book I love. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came well into my writing of The Covenant of Water, by which time I'd done a lot of research on Cast. But I just, you know, found it so enlightening and so helpful in what I was writing. Shout out to Isabel Wilkerson, yeah. yes. And I felt that um, it affirmed for me what I was trying to do in this passage, which is that issues of caste. And I love that she does never, she never uses the word racism. Because I love the, that she never used it's it. It's too loaded, it's too ambiguous. But caste is prevalent everywhere. It's, uh, it's not a, something that's confined to parts of India. It really is worldwide. Mm. Often hidden, often e not easy to see, but it's there. I also think that in my own life, mm -hmm. uh, and this will surprise people, there is a sort of casteism that I experienced in medicine. You know, um, every year there's a huge influx of foreign medical graduates from other countries who come to America, and they don't come unless there's a need, and there is a need, because we are the folks who fill in the slots in inner city hospitals and residency programs. So you enter into this caste system and you become very conscious. You can't apply to the upper crust places that, places where I now work at, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. You have to enter at this level and then work twice or thrice as hard to finally transition. So, you know, that, that sense of caste is ubiquitous. And in a funny way, I've, I've lived through it in a very refined setting where no one would assume that there was any sort of casteism, but there was. Particularly because you're in, in medicine, nobody would ever say. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a scene where Mariama has a big aha moment with the lepers at the religious convention. She says to Big Amachi on page 506, that's my point, I suppose. This year, I really saw them as people. I was immature before. I understood for the first time that they weren't always blind or always lame. Maybe they were born normal, like me, before a disease affected them. I thought, this can happen to me. It left me frightened, shaken, long after we sat down. Mm -hmm. Well, I was saying that one of the reasons why I appreciate this so much, this moment so much, is because I thought it was a brilliant foreshadowing, as we find out later, one of Mariama's family members could have been in that crowd. So the people that, when she has that realization, I thought maybe she's having that realization looking at somebody she 
would have known or might have known. Yeah, I'm not sure that I was trying to foreshadow that necessarily, but as you've discovered by now, I don't seem to yeah, have I, well, much of a clue. I had to... that thought myself, <laughs> and then I thought, well, no, you weren't doing that, right? But, you know, I, I think it's important for me to restate, if I haven't said it already, that the writer provides the words. The reader provides their imagination. imagination. And, and what's created in middle space is there. So if you thought I was foreshadowing, that is valid. It's not for me to say, no, I wasn't foreshadowing, or I was. Well, no, I, I actually appreciate the way you phrase things. You say, this is what was in my head at the time, or this is what I was thinking. It doesn't mean that once I, you, the readers, interpret it, that we're going to interpret it the same way that it was in your head. I think that's the beauty. That's of, the beauty of it. Yeah. I get PhD or a master's thesis on my previous books, mm -hmm. and they credit me with all kinds of motives and you know <laughs> and i have to laugh i mean they're not wrong it's their interpretation but mm -hmm. i can swear on a stack of bibles that that was not what i was trying to do in as they claim in that particular thesis so there's a there's you know a reading goes with interpretation and the interpretation is valid who am i to say they're wrong well there's so many great spiritual lessons in this book super solars in chapter 62 tonight wow that was a chapter. On page 511, you say, What is worry but fear of what the future holds? Baby Ma lives completely in the present and is spared all worry. Unlike her daughter, Big Amachi, now 79, increasingly inhabits the past, reliving the memories of her years in this house. Her life before Parambol, that fleeting childhood is like a dream that crumbles in daylight. She holds on to its edges while the middle vanishes. So what I wanted to ask you, are you baby Mall or are you <laughs> Amachi when it comes to present moment living? I don't think I'm either of them. I think I aspire to be mm -hmm. just like them. I mean, they truly, they truly are like that. I think... Um, my my uh, my sense for some of the autistic children that mm -hmm. I've been around, been very close to, is that you know. Uh, well, let me share with this with you. My my oldest brother has an autistic daughter, mm -hmm. and sometimes I think uh, God's gift was to give this child to them because the love our parents have for her is just you know something to behold. And my brother, I've never heard him complain about, you know, the, the lot he, he has in that sense. I mean, he would never, he would be indignant if I ever framed it in that way. Mm -hmm. But he always says about his daughter admiringly, he, he has never complained about it, but if he, ever, he, if he ever says something, it is all how completely she lives at the moment. Mm. You know, so if I had any sort of model for being in the moment, it was my niece. Oh, that's a beautiful, thank you for sharing that. So yet another loss that I didn't see coming, did y'all see this one, is when both Baby Mall and Big Amachi die on the same night. Oh, my heart. So Big Amachi's parting prayer uh, left me in a state. This was another passage I read over and over. In chapter 62 tonight, on page 517, Big Amachi prays for this. Such... Precious, precious water. Lord, water from our own well. This water that is our covenant with you, with this soil, with the life you granted us. We are born and baptized in this water. We grow full of pride. We sin, we are broken, we suffer. But with water, we are cleansed of our transgressions. We are forgiven and we are born again day after day till the end of our days. Mm. What struck me about this was that she turns and asks Baby Mall the same question she asks <laughs> every night, has asked every night for years, and Baby Mall doesn't give her an answer. And then she has the realization that, oh, this is the night. And so she's been given a death sentence, Abraham, and yet she is so open to it and welcoming it. This moment also struck uh, one of our readers, Mary. Let's hear from her. 
Hi, I'm Mary, and really grateful for the journey that Covenant of Water has taken me on. My question is about 1967. Um, Big Amachi, when she learns that it's time for her to go, she doesn't bargain for more time, but instead accepts it and goes about those last hours so peacefully, so lovingly. And my question is, uh, I think as we also saw with maybe like the character Rune, that when people know the end is near, but they know they've given all that they could and they had a great faith, do you find that their acceptance of the end is just more peaceful? And has that been your experience also in your practice of medicine? Thank you. Mm. Well, thank you for that very thoughtful question. Um, I think my experience in medicine has been varied, but for the most part, uh, there are times where I'm in awe of how faith carries people uh, through, with equanimity through, through the end. But I had in mind also that when you live a life where like the character Big Amici where, you know, every day you do your best, you start with a prayer, you have these rituals, you're not changing the world, but you're doing your role as a wife or a mother or whatever it is to the best of your ability and you make your peace with God at night and sometimes God speaks to you and doesn't. You are at peace in a way that when the end comes, it's not as though you had, you know, mountains to climb or uh, you know, symphonies to write. You, 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 are, you, are, you were fulfilled that day. It reminds me of a classic piece of advice by William Osler, uh, the physician that many of us in America model our teaching and education on. He died in 1917, but he was traveling to, I think, Oxford or to England on a, on a steamer, trying to think of a speech he had to give at a graduation. And he heard these doors slamming throughout this big ship he was on, like giant sounds, booming sounds. And he asked the captain, what was that? And the captain said, ever since the Titanic, we have our ship's uh, holes divided into watertight compartments, and those are the doors closing. And William Osler's timeless advice in this very famous speech, I mean famous in medical circles, but less so now, people mm -hmm. have forgotten him, was, to live each day in daytight compartments. You know, you just get up, act as though this is the last day. And if it were, give it your best. You know, don't wait to be nice to someone tomorrow. Be nice today. Mm. Don't wait to be, don't wait for anything. Right. Give it your all. And so I was trying to capture that quality. This scene is one I can remember. I remember we, I needed to get back to Parambil to be describing something, you know. And I got back and I just suddenly knew that this good woman could not live forever. Mm. And if she couldn't live, neither could her daughter. I, I didn't want to subject her to the loss of her daughter. Mm. They're real to me. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah, very real. They're real to us. They're real to us. They're real to us. And who would have taken care of baby Maul anyway? I mean, she was thinking that in those final moments, like yeah. who would take care of my daughter? Right. And it's why when she asked baby Maul a question, baby Maul just sort of smiled at the corner. Right, but, yeah. yeah. And she's asking the question as a joke, sort of, as a yes. ritual, but it's also because if it's her night, then she needs to scramble to make arrangements, you see? And, uh, she sort of has put things in place where there's nothing to scramble. She knows this daughter will be loved and beloved. She doesn't know it's baby Ma's end as well. But, uh, you The fact know. that they are found together. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, gosh. You can write. <laughs> you can write. Let's move on to part eight. In chapter 63, The Embodied and the Disembodied, on page 529, Dr. Cowper has this to say. Ladies and gentlemen, we are merely renting these bodies of ours. You came into this world on a in-breath. You will exit on an out-breath. You know, it's so interesting when he said that, I underlined it in my book and started 
it's not like we don't know that we came in on an in-breath and are going to go out on an out-breath, but there's something so profound and clarifying about that. That word, yes. exhale, right? Yes, that's it. you're going out on an you exhale. Expire. You expire and you, you inspire. <laughs> absolutely. Does being aware of this and constantly being reminded by seeing, as we talked about in a previous episode, the violation of the spirit that disease brings allow for doctors, you think, to be more prescient and conscious beings than the rest of us? No, I wouldn't go that far. I you think, wouldn't go I that think far. We're, if anything, sometimes we're guilty of a kind of hubris as though disease can only happen to other people. This is our contract with God. And so I'm, I'm always shocked when I read physician narratives about their own illness and and you know they're writing so movingly about what's happening to them, and I'm thinking, really, this is what it took for you to to realize to, it. You realize what they're feeling, and so I'm a bit impatient with that. But I, I think that there is a necessary kind of denial we need when we're taking care of people that mm -hmm. doesn't get in the way of our making good decisions. You know, in an emergency, airway, breathing, circulation, you can't be worrying about too much else. But I think that I like to think that many of us and it might take some years to get there, are very conscious of the poignancy of every moment, every life. Uh, I, when I was younger, speaking for myself, I really felt this is awful stuff that's happening. And I never thought that I could, it could ever happen to me. You know, and then you start being humble. The classmate gets a fatal illness or a chronic illness or, you know, you yourself get something that, you know, requires... And, suddenly you realize, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not apart from any mm -hmm, of this. Mm -hmm. And when you reach that particular moment, which often goes with gray so hairs. Would you say that, no, you said er, to us earlier in an earlier episode that you started to have hearing loss early on, like in your 40s, 50s. And so was that humbling for you? Did that make you? That, that's a great example. But yes. there, there are more examples. For example, when I was a young intern, I used to look at some of my patients in the VA, for example, and think, God, the files are so thick, you know? How can someone have so many different conditions going on, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're taking this many medications, and, you know, what's with the knees? I mean, I look at the, you know, all these falls in the elderly. Why do we have to study falls in the elderly? What's mm -hmm. so special about falls in the elderly? Because you're young and arrogant, and you don't really understand. And, you know, you get to my age, and you suddenly realize that, you know, the, the mobility isn't something you take for granted. Your balance could easily right. be upset. You're not as nimble as you once were. Bone density and all that. Exactly. And so, you know, I think doctors need to be humbled by experience. Uh, you can't just teach it and expect someone to get it. I certainly didn't. During an exam, whoa, this was a moment in the book, one of Mariama's professors, Dr. Briji Sakar, is that, what's that how you pronounce yep. it? Briji Sakar, attempts to sexually assault her. And you describe Mariama's counterattack as a cornered animal's desperate instinct to survive. I know that scene really resonated with so many of our women readers, especially when she thinks to herself, is this my fault? you know, where she's going. How did you know to do that? I don't know that I knew to do that, except that I knew that I was working in an environment where, you know, many of my cousin sisters and, you know, fellow medical students, I knew were the subject of a lot of unwanted attention, you know, mm -hmm. getting into a packed bus and someone grabs you, unnecessary comments. Mm -hmm. It's almost a lot of women, you know, when I was going to college there, and so I was very conscious and aware of that. And sometimes it would take much more overt forms. But I've taken some great fictional liberties with mm -hmm. this. But, you know, uh, put your hand in my pocket, referring to a coat pocket, wasn't terribly unusual uh, as a way of testing you. Put your hand in the pocket and identify the bone. But it was also unnecessary, you know. Um, so that was done. I've heard it being done. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't. I don't say. I, I can't swear that I'd experienced it. Um, but it was done, probably by a well-meaning older professor. Yeah. But in this day and age, you know, we would look at that as you know uh, scandalous. I mean, the way we view things have changed radically. This experience that I recount 
is fictional, but I would go so far as to say that it could easily have happened. That variations on this theme are things I heard about. Mm. Susanna, you have a favorite passage from part eight. Hi, I'm Susanna, and I could not put the 700-page book down. There are so many powerful, powerful quotes in this book, and my favorite is by Mariama, and she says, One shouldn't just hope to be treated well. One must insist on it. I was just wondering, do you have a favorite quote or a quote that sticks out in your mind? Well, I have uh, many favorite quotes. Uh, thank you for that question. I have many favorite quotes. I would often go looking in my notebook. I, I, I love to keep quotes. Uh, one of my friends who I've gotten to know over many years at the Sun Valley Writers Workshop, Hector Elizondo, the actor, has posted notes all over his room with interesting quotes, and mm. it, it peppers his speech. So I collect quotes, but not on my wall, in different places. And, so I, I, I try to make use of the ones that are operative in my life. But my favorite must be, you know, the one from Ecclesiastes, you know, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, because there is no succor or wisdom or knowledge in the grave. Mm. So, but I have many. Um, that must be my all-time favorite. Oh, mine is secrets live in the same room as loneliness. Not that you were asking me, but I'm <laughs> In part eight, Mariama starts to crack the code of the condition. She realizes it involves uh, parts of the brain associated with hearing and balance. And so many readers have questions about the condition. Here's one from Louisa. Hi, my name is Louisa. Um, I finished the book about a week, week and a half ago, and I can't get it off my mind. Absolutely epic story. My question would be is where did you come up with the idea for the condition? Is it something as a physician that you've encountered? Um, is it something that you've seen has been uh, through families just like it was in the book? Well, thank you for that question. So I, I, I think as a longtime teacher of medicine, um, I am fond of arcania. I'm fond of, you know, unusual things that um, you tuck away and you trot them out in certain mm -hmm. teaching moments you use them to quiz students with. And um, this rare, very rare familial disorder that runs through generations, it really hasn't been reported very much. I've, I've made more of it than it exists, than the way it exists in reality. Uh, but I found it in a book called Zebra Cards, which is like a, a book uh, by a friend of mine. I've gotten to know him now. His name is John Sotos. And when he was chief resident at Hopkins, he began in his compulsive way to collect these little index cards and decided to make a book out of it. And that always fascinated me, you know, to ask a student the question, what causes familial drowning? And they always just go off in tangents and one day you tell them what it was. So I had tucked that away and um, this seemed like the great place to bring it out. Uh, a story set in a land where people swim before they walk, where water is everywhere and where if you happen to be someone who avoids water and despite that winds up drowning, you know, that would stand out. So it had a dramatic element to it and it was, it just worked. Have you always had such a vivid, uh, uh, fluid imagination? I think my mother would say that I, <laughs> I did, you know. I would often invent stories to get where I wanted, or to explain where I had been. <laughs> mm, mm. So it was actually the most remarkable uh, thing about her old age and my older age is that uh, we had such a wonderful, loving relationship when she was in her 80s and 90s and living in Palo Alto. She'd become the sweet old lady instead of this fearsome <laughs> mother that I used to mm. dodge around. So yeah, I suppose I did, but not consciously in terms of, oh, I've got the imagination too. Let's talk about the dramatic death of Philippos, the scenes where he realizes Elsie is alive, and then he hops on a train to find her, only to be derailed off that bridge. I know y'all were just like I was. I was like, I couldn't, be I couldn't believe it. OK, first of all, he's just dozing and thinking about some things, and then people are flying through the train, 
And the next thing you know, the train, parts of the train are underwater. My heart was in my throat. Where, were you, where, where was your heart when you were writing this? Yeah. That was perhaps the most difficult uh, scene for me to write. Mm. I'm the most moving to me. I mean, as I mentioned, I get emotional with all the tragic scenes in the book, but that one, maybe because I most closely identified with Philippos, um, he was more me. I mean, they're all me in the sense that, you know, for, for years when I was a younger writer, I would resist this. So it's not me. It's not autobiographical, but now it's all from my head. So I suppose at some level it's me. Um, but there were some things going on here where in order to solve the condition, I realized at some point Mariama would have to find a, a way to look at someone in after they had died to see where the problem was. Mm. And it seemed like her father would be the most moving way she could do this. So I, I recognized that he had to die. Mm. I mean, first of all, he needs a reason to take this trip. And so it had to be something momentous for a guy yeah. who's terrified of leaving the It house. had to be super compelling. It had to be super important. It had to be slightly mysterious to keep the, the tension of the revelation that's coming uh, up. But it also had to be the end of his journey, literally. Um, and so the scene was, in that sense, very, very mannered in that I knew what was going to happen. But when I started to write the drowning part, those are the times when you, you, know, you're, you don't know where all this is coming from and you're just so emotionally wrought writing it and revising it. And, you know, you're just trying to make the whole world of his life you know, come together, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he's reaching out for this child. He's atoning for Nainan, you know, the child that's drowning. So it was a very, very difficult scene to write, a difficult scene to read. This is another one that had all of us in the recording studio for the audiobooks mm -hmm. reaching for tissue because by then, you know, the, the producer and the... The studio technician knew the story well, and we'd come to this place, and it was a surprise to them. They hadn't read the book before, and so they were experienced. They hadn't read the book. Well, you know, they, yes. they didn't need to read the book. I needed to read the <laughs> right, book. Right, right, right. <laughs> they hadn't read the book. So we arrived at this point, and... Can you go to page 592? Chapter. Page 592, that's where it is. Oh, you're going to make me read this? The very last paragraph? I'm not going to make you, but you can read it if you would like to read it. I'd like to be able to read it. Okay, good. I hope I can read okay. it. Okay. He takes a deep breath, pulling the skies, the stars, and the stars beyond those stars into his lungs. And Lord, Lord, my Lord, where are you? Lord, I breathe you in. Lord, breathe on me. Breathe on me, breath of God. For once in his life, freed of indecision, freed from doubt, he is absolutely sure of what he must do. Sorry. I, lo I love that reading. This is how it was when I was revising it. Yeah. It was so hard to do this. You know? And I revised by reading aloud. Mm -hmm. That's how I know it sounds good. And mm -hmm. it was just very hard to do. For once in his life, freed of indecision, freed from doubt, he is absolutely sure of what he must do. And that is succumb to this moment. It is to rescue mm -hmm. that child mm -hmm. at the expense of his own life. Mm -hmm. you know? But yet we'd never know if the child got rescued. We don't. No, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Pretty incredible. I mean, every reader makes their own decision. I don't know the answer. You don't know the answer. Ah, well, thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. After Mariama allows her father's body to be autopsied, you write in chapter 71, the dead shall rise incorruptible. On page 596, those who earlier viewed the open casket never saw the long incision at the back of his head running from ear to ear, just under the hairline. His scalp was peeled forward and his calvarium opened to remove his brain. 
I was thinking all those people looking at that would never have imagined that. And you knew from the beginning someone would have to be sacrificed. Mariama needed their brain. And so when Bigamachi uh, foreshadowed earlier, Lord, send us someone who can find a cure. Did you know in that m moment when, when Bigamachi said that? No. That this is how it would, how it would end up? No. no. I mean, I, for a long time I thought it would be Philippus, but the way his character evolved, it didn't look like he was going to be capable of this. Mm. And, um, and that would have been too easy for her son to, yeah. to solve it. And so, and then I was left with, well, who's going to solve it? And so it had to be the Mariama. Mm. And then at some point it came to me that if she solved it because of her father, that would be something. Okay. After years away studying medicine, Mariama returns home. And then in chapter 72, the disease of von Recklinghausen. It's on page 605 where you write, Seven years after she first stepped into the red fort, she leaves Madras with tearful goodbyes to Anita, Chinna, Uma, and so many others. She will begin her two-year bond in a brand new but unfurnished four-story mission hospital that is to have the absolute best equipment. She'll be its first, and for now, its only physician. The location of this mission hospital is a stone's throw from where her grandmother lit the lamp on the occasion of her birth, the district village of Parambil. Let's go to Karen's question. Hi, my name is Karen. I love your books. I'm also a physician. I'm a gynecologist. And one of the really unique and special things about your writing is how vividly and accurately you portray the art of medicine and the humanism in grappling with disease, both as a patient and a healer. I was wondering about your writing process. When you're first developing the ideas for your books, do you know right away that you're going to be featuring physicians as characters and disease elements as part of the plot? Or do you have a more broad idea for story arc and the medical details fill in to support the story? Yeah, uh, uh, that's a common question. I'm so sorry to disappoint readers. Um, that's the downside of, you know, of uh, talking about process. But I wish I knew. I, I wish I knew the oh. whole plot before I began. I would be delighted if I knew the ending, if I knew the disease, if I knew the characters. Um, I have a friend and mentor in John Irving, and he knows the first and last line of every chapter. He knows mm -hmm. the beginning and ending of the book. And I feel I eventually get there, but I get there through writing, through many twists and turns. So uh, I am constantly looking for a way to be more efficient when and if I ever write another novel. And by the way, I, I never feel like I can fit, do another novel. I feel all of me is in here. Mm -hmm. So it's not a thought that I'm juggling right now, you know, mm -hmm. what's the next novel. But if I did, I'd want to be more efficient. This is not the most efficient way to write a book. Mm -hmm. I think this is the most appropriate place to end. We're going to end our conversation on part eight right now. And we have one more episode to go, parts nine and ten, the absolutely stunning conclusion in our next podcast. And we'll talk to you then. Bye, everyone. I know this novel has made an impact on everyone who reads it, I'd love to hear your thoughts and how it has impacted you. Find us at Oprah's Book Club on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, and check out Oprah Daily for even more about The Covenant of Water and author Abraham Verghese. A tale that leaves its imprint on a listener. The Covenant of Water audiobook is narrated by the author, Abraham Verghese. It's available now wherever books are sold. Until next time, goodbye, everybody.